That though we all may face emptiness, and I think all of us will face periods, times, seasons of emptiness, while we will all face emptiness, we do not have to fear emptiness. We may all face emptiness, but we do not have to fear emptiness. Why do we not have to fear emptiness? Two reasons. One, because God has a plan even for our emptiness. God has a plan for your emptiness. And if God has a plan for your emptiness, here's the cool thing. Nothing can be the start of something. If God has a plan for your emptiness, nothing can be the start of something. Because he will be, as we talked about yesterday, he will be active and moving, even in our emptiness. So today, I want to talk about three ways that God is at work, even in our emptiness. Because if, perhaps, you arrive here today feeling as empty as Al Capone's vault, this is a word for you. One to grab onto, to trust, and to walk with in your day and in your days to come. With that being available to us, pray with me. Let's invite the Lord to speak to us. When Elijah heard that he was to walk the Zarephath, here's what he had in front of him, a 50 to 60 mile walk through the wilderness to go to an unknown land and hang out with some unknown people. Now, I would imagine that Elijah would have done that had the word of the Lord come to him, even if the brook had stayed flowing. Imagine he would have. Here's a better question. Would we do that if the brook stayed flowing? Often we don't. Often, God has to push us in the direction to which he calls us. And he loves us enough to do that. And he loves us enough to do that because God knows this. What he has in store for us is often not found where we are, but to a place that he's calling us to. I want you to hear that again. What God has for you is often not found in the place where you are now, but in a place that he is calling you to. And what that often involves is change. Last December, a year ago last December, I did the funeral of a friend of mine, a man named Art Hansen. Art passed away at 94 years old, finally able to see his Savior. When Art was a teenager, he was a member of the Norwegian Resistance. He had incredible stories of being a teenager running around taking illegal radios and things to families in Norway. Amazing stories of the war, and most of the stories that he has, I'm convinced, are true. <laughs> he is Norwegian. <laughs> Art told me of a story that occurred when he was a teenager. Because his father was a shipbuilder, the occupying Nazis knew that Art knew his way around seafaring crafts. And the Nazis had a plan. They were going to travel up the fjord that led to Oslo, and they were going to leave sea mines, those explosive devices you see in the old movies. They were going to mine the access way to Oslo so that if there was a liberating force that came by sea, they would encounter those mines. And so the plan was this. They loaded many, many mines onto barges, and they were going to take those explosives by barge up the fjord and then lay them out. And Art knew that was a very, very dangerous proposition. He didn't want to go. He tried to avoid it as long as he could, but they found him. And they pressed him into service, gave him no choice. So for three long days, Art sailed up that fjord very, very carefully with those explosive devices. The evening before they were supposed to put them out and deploy them, Art sat on the barge, looking off in the distance at the city skyline, and prominent on that skyline was a steeple 
And that's when Art heard the church bell ring. And he realized that it was the middle of the week, and this was a mid-week prayer service. And Art told me this is what he concluded. He said, I decided if this was going to be my last night on earth, which he was convinced it would be, I was going to spend it with God's people. And so he snuck off the boat, snuck off the barge, eluding the Nazis. Think about that the next time you're contemplating going to church on a Sunday morning. <laughs> he sneaks off the barge and goes into the prayer service. And it was the custom in those days to have visitors just give a word of greeting. We don't do that to our visitors these days. And Art just simply said, I'm so glad I belong to Jesus. And he said that because he was convinced he would be meeting Jesus very, very soon. And I love the prayer service afterwards. Some people came up to him, asked him what brought him uh, to their church. And finally, Art couldn't contain it anymore. And he just told the whole story. He said, wait right here. Wait right here. A few minutes later, a guy came with a little envelope, a little folded over piece of paper, said, this is an address. Be there in half an hour. Art looked at it, found his way to that address. A truck came up, picked him up, drove him deep into the woods of Norway where he stayed for a year and a half living with the family. When Art got out, he asked what happened back to those, that excursion of laying out the mines. And here's what happened. Uh, the Royal Air Force, the British RAF, learned about what was happening. And when the barges went out to lay out the mines, the RAF attacked. And two of the three barges were destroyed. God protected Art by drawing him in his emptiness, in his loneliness, in his fear, by drawing him to church. God used Art's emptiness to guide him, to direct him to what he had for him. If you are empty this morning, if your life feels like Kareth, where the brook has dried up, is it possible that God is pushing you to a place you wouldn't go otherwise? To do something you might not do otherwise, but there's, there's only dryness where you are now. God uses emptiness to direct it. We may have to direct us. We may have to face emptiness, but we don't have to fear it. Well, Al, and I guarantee you, at some point in the series that you will hear after mine, that Dr. Jordan's going to do, he's going to tell you not to do that because that is what leads to worry, and that is what heightens anxiety. I'm going to give you another reason why you should not do that, and that's this. God is really good at bringing the unexpected data point into your life. You can say, but it's going like this. Do you know what God does? He brings that unexpected point that completely changes the arc of your life. And for this widow, that unexpected point was a prophet named Elijah. Elijah said, oh, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. When a preacher's hungry, you better feed me. And then make something for yourself and your son. I, I, that just cracks me up. You know, make me that piece, but then you can have something. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up. The jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah, for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by, spoken by Elijah. The second reason why you do not have to fear emptiness is because God will sustain you in your emptiness. God will sustain you in your emptiness, but we are not comfortable with that. Notice that what the word says here is that the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. 
This word does not say they were just filled with overflowing so that the woman could barely get into the door of her house because there was so much flour and so much oil. They had a little tiny bit, but that little tiny bit was enough. I think we would be better off often if we learned how to embrace being sustained. That's all that God has for us. He wants to give us just enough. And the reason why God wants to give us just enough is because when he gives us just enough, we take it and we use it. And guess what? The very next day, we're coming back to him for more. That's his plan. That's his plan. But often we will not experience his plan because like the widow, the first step in seeing God sustain us is often, often feels like a step in the wrong direction. The widow says, hey, I've just got a tiny little bit of oil and a tiny little bit of flour. It's all I've got. So unfortunately, you're going to have to have somebody else give you your bread. Elisha says, no, go bake that bread and give me some. Then you can eat. That seems like a step in the wrong direction, but it's not. It's a step of obedience so that we have no problem understanding where this sustaining power is coming from. A little girl named Lily was really excited by her mom's birthday coming. And she was very excited because her dad had promised to take her to the store to shop for a birthday present for her. Dad's car pulled in. Lily jumped in the passenger side, put on her seatbelt, and they were off. And she did not stop talking the whole way to the store. When she got there, she could barely contain herself. And she darted into what she knew was her mom's favorite store. And there she looked at all manner of things. But when she saw a scarf hanging on the rack, she knew that's exactly what she wanted to buy. It was a beautiful scarf, her mom's favorite color, which was green, and it had daisies on it. And daisies were her mom's favorite, favorite flower. And she went over and she kind of separated herself from her dad and she felt the scarf and it was the most beautiful feeling thing she had ever felt in her life. She was so excited. She reached into her little purse and she pulled out her $4.75. She said, it's time, I'm gonna buy mom this present. She took the scarf and her 475 to the counter and laid them both on the counter where a nice woman came along and said, oh, what a lovely scarf. Lily said, this is for my mom. And the lady affirmed, oh, this is beautiful. And she scanned a few things and there were a couple of beeps. And then she said, that would be $29.99. And that's what Lily thought. <laughs> She didn't know what to do. She froze. It was at that, about at that moment that she heard a reassuring voice behind her and said, Lily, what did you find? It was her father. And Lily didn't even know what to say or how to answer. But the father said, oh, this is beautiful. It's a scarf. Mom's favorite color and daisies. And then the father reached over and took her 475 and handed it to the lady. Now what Lily did not see was that he also handed her a little piece of plastic. <laughs> and the woman took that and did a few things Lily didn't fully understand. And then she, she asked Lily a question she did not expect to be asked. Would you like this gift wrap? And Lily just unbelievably shook her, nodded her head. And before long, she had walked out of the store with a beautiful scarf and a beautiful box wrapped in beautiful wrapping paper. And she didn't really understand everything that had happened, but there was one thing she learned that day, that when you take what you have and you put it in the hand of your father, all that you have is more than enough. When we take what we have, 475, if that's all it is, 
But when we take what we have and we put it in the hand of our Father, all that we have is more than enough because He will sustain us. He will make it enough. Or you can try to live in self-sufficiency, which means you will live in fear. Notice the first thing that Elijah said was, don't be afraid. And you will live in failure because we were not created to live in self-sufficiency. We do not have to fear emptiness because our God sustains us even in emptiness. Well, there's a third part of this story. And the story takes a strange turn. And the strange turn is this. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse. And finally, he stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What have you against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? It made no sense to her. And frankly, it makes no sense to us at first glance. Why God would go to such amazing, miraculous lengths to sustain the woman and her son, only then to allow the son to die. And so the woman is asking this question, why? Why? Why did you drag this out? Why couldn't it have at least happened on my terms? Why did you give me the burden of hope? And ask all of the questions that we often ask at these points of loss. Why? Well, the answer is because God had an end game. God had an end game in mind because God understood what this woman's real need was. And this woman's real need had nothing to do with flour or oil or even bread. This woman's real need was deeper than that. And God was allowed to do something that would fill it. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy? Even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. And the woman said to Elijah, Now that you are a man of God, word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Now I know that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Compare that to the first conversation this woman had with Elijah. As surely as the Lord your God lives. Your God. This woman's deepest need is the deepest need that all of us have. And it is not the need for anything that God can provide. It is the need for the provider himself. And sometimes what God has to do is pull the provision away from us so that we say, I am empty. I have nothing. And then God steps into that void and says, here, now you have. Years ago, when my mom and dad lived in Florida for the better part of the year, although I don't think any part of the year spent in Florida is the better part of the year, but that's just When they were most of the time in Florida, we would send them their Christmas gifts, and that was nice. We'd have nice conversations on the phone, but there was an emptiness to it. There was something that was missing, and what was missing became clear to us one particular Christmas. When there was enough time during the Christmas break for us to drive to Florida and go and visit them. Especially from their side, because though they were satisfied with having us send them their presents, they were far more fulfilled when we brought them their presents. Because life was better 
when our presence was accompanied by our presence. And how much more is that the case with God? The deepest need that you will ever have is a need for him. And there is no need that he cannot fill, but there is no need that is really filled unless it is filled with him. So what is he seeking to do in this woman's life? Bring about whatever form of emptiness that is necessary to draw her to him. She believed that God was afflicting her. She wasn't. He wasn't. He was attracting her to him. We do not need to fear emptiness because God fills our emptiness with himself. Often what we pray for is, Lord, give me the provision. I lost the provision, give me the provision. And sometimes he does not answer that prayer, or when he answers it, the answer is no. And he says, no, I'm not going to give you more of that provision. I, it, it, as deep and as precious as, and, and as important as that provision might seem, I'm not going to fill that gap with provision. I'm going to fill it with myself, the provider. And the question I ask of all of us this morning is, are we seeking the provision or the provider? We all face emptiness. We all face emptiness, but we do not have to fear emptiness. Why? Because God has a plan for our emptiness. And if God has a plan for our emptiness, nothing can be the start of something. It really, really can are you facing emptiness this morning? How might God be guiding you, directing you in your emptiness? Have you asked him? If you do, you may get the answer. And it may take you someplace where his purpose in your life can be fulfilled. Are you feeling empty this morning? Well, God will sustain you in your emptiness. Give you just enough. <laughs> but scarcity is not weakness when it involves dependence upon God. Allow Him to sustain you. Are you feeling empty this morning? God will fill your emptiness with Himself. Allow Him to do that. Consider if it's the provision you've been longing for when the provider wants to be available to you. If there's a plan for you in your emptiness, prophet only, but this is the story of how you love and how you care for your people. Fill our emptiness, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.